Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Kislak Center of the Penn Libraries. My name is Costandia Constandino. I am the H. Carlton Rogers III, Vice Provost and Director of the Penn Libraries. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the 88th Annual Rosenbach Lectures in Bibliography at the Penn Libraries. Founded in 1931, this distinguished lecture series is the longest of its kind in North America. The lectures are endowed by the generous funding provided by A.S.W. Rosenbach, a native of Philadelphia and a Penn graduate, and perhaps the greatest antiquarian book dealer of the 20th century. Now, the list of scholars, both men and women, who gave the Rosenbach lectures during the past eight decades is remarkable. And I am delighted that this year, the lectures will focus on the transmission of knowledge between the various cultures of the Mediterranean world. This is a subject that fascinated the Penn Library's greatest donor and benefactor, Larry Schoenberg, whose collections in this area was one of his most distinct accomplishments and achievements. And because of such a gift by Larry Schoenberg and Barbara Britzel, Penn has one of the most renowned manuscript collections. I would like to thank many of my colleagues at the Penn Libraries and those who serve on the Rosenbach Committee for supporting the Rosenbach Lectures. Especially, I would like to thank my colleague, David McKnight, director of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library for his help in engaging speakers and setting up the arrangements for these lectures. Thank you, David. I look forward to a wonderful week of scholarship and community engagement. I also like to invite you to join us after the lectures to the reception and at this point, I would like to invite Professor Rita Copland, the Shelley Z. and Barton X. Rosenbach Professor of the Humanities, Professor of Classical Studies, English, and Comparative Literature at the Penn University, who will introduce this year's Rosenbach Lecturer, Professor Charles Barnett. Introductions of distinguished speakers often begin with some form of the inexpressibility topos. It would be impossible to describe how much, how many. But the contributions of Charles Burnett to the global history of science and philosophy and the material incarnations of this history truly do defy summary. We are honored to welcome here to deliver the 2019 Rosenbach Lectures. He is professor of the history of Islamic influence in Europe at the Warburg Institute in London, where he has taught since 1985. Over those decades, his interests have come to define much of what the Warburg stands for in terms of the movements of cultures and ideas across time and space, study unbounded by disciplinary specialties. Simply to go to floor three of the Warburg and look at its remarkable holdings in medieval Arabic Syriac and Hebrew philosophical writings is to see the aggregate of Charles's influence. He counts among his fields the histories of arithmetic, geometry, astrology, and astronomy, medicine and magic, including divination. At one of his lectures, I remember how he pulled out of his pocket the shoulder blade of a sheep in order to illustrate how it would have been used in divinations. He has published both as author and as editor over 100 books and book-length articles on figures ranging from Abu Mashar, the astronomer of Baghdad, to Adelard of Bath, the Anglo-Latin naturalist and student of Arabic mathematics and astronomy. From the polymath Al-Kindi to the physician Constantine the African and Maimonides to Peter Abelard and Hildegard of Bingen. He has been recognized with many honors, including delivering the British Library Panizzi Lectures. He's a vigorous collaborator with global partners for big funded projects on cultural contacts, including Islam and Tibet, 8th through 17th centuries, and 
encounters with the Orient in early modern European scholarship. Add to this his studies on early modern contacts between Europe and Japan. I cannot imagine anyone who's been thanked more in the acknowledgments of books published in many languages and many places around the world and on many subject matters. Any of you here who've been privileged to work with him will know his utter generosity and kindness. The loyalty of his many former students and advisees is legendary. The moment that you touch any area adjacent to medieval and early modern scientific learning, you encounter Charles's work to guide you with clarity and wit, to see the sense of how it all fits together, the social, material, linguistic, and cognitive paths that ideas take. The story of transmission begins with understanding the methods of Arabic philosophy and science. Here, the Arabic translations of Greek philosophy and the translations from Arabic to Latin can return us to an understanding of Arabic thought itself. Charles encourages us to meditate on the logistics of the transmission, the interaction of Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the various medieval centers of learning. Only then do we turn to the, consider the dynamics of reception, the revolutionary impact of Islamic sciences on Western Europe. The subject of his Rosenbach lectures this week is Arabic and Greek science and philosophy, form and style in the transmission to the Latin West. No subject could be better suited to Penn's Schoenberg collection of manuscripts, which is famous for its strength in medieval scientific texts in Arabic, Latin, and Greek. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Charles Burnett, who will speak tonight on the translator as Idus Interpris. Thank you very much, Lisa. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I feel, I feel very privileged to be invited to give this lecture, or the series of lectures, and I feel a very, um, that is a great challenge for me, and uh, um, I hope I can rise to the challenge. As you will notice, some of you, this is from one of the Schoenberg manuscripts. It's a picture of a Dominican um, preaching, or teaching rather, um, his students medicine. You can see the word medicina on the right-hand side um, from a 12th century manuscript. And this medicina is, of course, from the Arabs. Um, now, I warn you that this lecture will be longer than the second and the third lecture, so I hope you can bear with me. I shall promise that the guillotine will fall at exactly one hour, and so um, I shall stop as soon as I feel the blade on my neck. Um, so um, please, uh, please excuse um, um, my, um, uh, my prolixity. I'm talking, um, uh, I'm going to begin my talk um, by asking you to imagine that you are with Boethius and his friends in the warmth of a country house in the mountains of Aurelia in the middle of winter, discussing the contents of Porphyry's Isagoge. I was quite surprised, in fact, how mild Philadelphia was, so it's not quite feeling the middle of winter. But imagine that you were having this um, friendly discussion about logic. Naturally, the first thing to decide, as Boethius, as Fabius says, is on what expositores vel etiam commentatores, two words for the interpreters of a text, need to address before they can make the souls of their pupils ready to accepting the teaching of a book. And you have a list of these actually on your handout because this will be a kind of leitmotif which will go through all three lectures. The aim of the book, or purpose, um, Boethius gives both the Greek and the Latin for all these terms, the skopos. Secondly, the, utility, the util, utilitas, or the usefulness. Thirdly, the order of the subject matter. Fourth, whether the book is really by the person whose work it is said to be. Fifthly, the title of the book. Sixthly, to which part of philosophy each book is aimed. What I shall be concerned about in these lectures is the purpose of books, especially the first item there, the intentio. And in particular, books recovered from the Arabs and to a lesser extent from the Greeks, from the late 10th to the 13th century, and to show how this purpose is reflected 
in their forms and style. In the first lecture, I shall concentrate on the translations themselves. In the following lectures, I shall be adding the role of glosses and commentaries. To put it in most simple terms, I am looking at a development of a raw translation into a polished one, into a gloss work, and finally into a work in which the gloss has become a full commentary. Of course, it is rare to see a single work exhibiting all these stages, and each of these stages depend on several environmental features. We can see how effective a work may be at conveying information from our own perspective and from that of the medieval actors themselves, and listen to what they have to say about what they are doing. I shall also bring in, as ex examples, some manuscripts from the Schoenberg collection, which I feel very happy to have had the chance to look at more closely, um, since it is particularly rich in scientific manuscripts in Arabic and in Latin. The story of the transmission of texts in the Western tradition is well known. Simply put, a whole body of Greek scientific and philosophical texts were translated into Arabic, often via Syriac, and especially in Baghdad in the ninth century. We are dealing with a large range of literary genre, themselves modeled on the Greek precedents. There are the basic textbooks in the various sciences, Nicomachus for arithmetic, Nicomachus plus Ptolemy for music, and Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos for astrology. Nicomachus's work on arithmetic and music were each called eisagoge in Greek, introductions. And this term is reflected in the Arabic word mudchal from the root dachala, meaning introduction or entry, entrance way. Then there were the more advanced scientific works, of which the principal, of the finest example, is Ptolemy's Almagest. In Greek, this was called her syntaxis mathematica, the mathematical summa. The Arabs chose to call it the big book, al-kitab al-kabir, known as al-majisti, um, a transliteration of a secondary title in Greek that simply meant the greatest, her magister. Aristotle's corpus of works on logic, natural science, and ethics, and metaphysics, indicated um, provided another literary genre, but it is noticeable that they do not have titles indicating this genre beyond that of book. And the description by others of them as being his esoteric teaching, which was in need of interpretation. Hence arose in Greek, and specifically, or especially with Porphyry in the late, in the 13th century, sorry, in the 3rd century, the genre of the Lemmatized commentary, the Hypomnema, um, arose, and it was these commentaries that arrived in the Arabic world, um, known in Arabic and often lost in Greek, are those by Alexander of Aphrodisia, Syrianus, John Philoponus, Pseudo-Simplicius, and Olympiodorus. Some of Aristotle's works arrived in the form of paraphrases, notably those of Themistius. Then there are the short texts on specific philosophical subjects by Alexander of Aphrodisias, second to third century AD, of which the most notable are those collected in a work called in Greek, Physikon, Aporion, Kailuseon, Bibliatres, three books of questions and answers on natural philosophy, of which several um, survive only in Arabic, several of these letters, where they're called razai, literally letters, one could say treatises. Alternatively, the doctrines of the philosophers could be listed one by one in the gnome, as they were, in the gnomologia, um, such as that by Pseudo Plutarch or Aetius, which was translated into Arabic. A similar situation can be observed with medicine. Hippocrates' usually short works were commented, uh, completed by commentaries by Echelen. These included his aphorisms, which especially called for explanation. There were also summaries, Jawami in Arabic, while 16 Alexandrian of the more than 200 works of Achelen were chosen for special attention in, the, in Alexandria, called therefore the Alexandrian curriculum. A summary of Galen doctrine was also translated, the so-called Summa Alexandrinorum. Oliver Overwein um, has recently demonstrated that this text was most likely transmitted as a series of tree diagrams, divisions and subdivisions set out like a family tree, um, which was tashjir in Arabic from shadra, meaning tree. What was not so successful was the transmission of text in dialogue form. 
Aristotle followed Plato in writing dialogues which are now lost, and very few of the dialogues of Plato for one reason or another were transmitted into Arabic. The main source of Arabic knowledge of Plato's dialogues were the summaries of Galen. The true dialogue form represented by Plato's dialogues involves several participants and works out an argument through discussion. Another genre involves arranging information as questions and answers to a series of, and answers to a series of questions often disguised as a conversation between a master and a pupil. I don't call this a genuine platonic form. So we have the mathertes, that is the didaskalos, or the mu'alim and the muta'alim. The Arabs, in translating these texts, naturally took over the forms in which they were written and wrote original texts in these forms. As we shall see, they were quite precise in describing the genres. Establishing the basic introductory preliminaries was followed in logic by Ibn Muqaffa and in medicine by Hunayn ibn Ishaq in the ninth century, in astronomy by Al-Fargani, who takes up the Euclidean term elements in Arabic usul in the title of his work, and in astrology by Al-Kabisi and Abu Masha, both using the term mudkal, which I've already introduced. A more advanced textbook might be called a jumal, literally a summa, or in fact, more literally, summa in the plural, um, collections or sums, as in the example of Abu Masha's book on historical astrology, which has as its short title, The Book of Religions and Dynasties, but as its full, true title, this is the book of the jumal, the summae, of the indications of the celestial bodies on terrestrial events occurring in the world of generation and corruption. The commentary genre thrived in Arabic. For example, we have the commentary, Shah, on Euclid's Elements by Nairizi, the commentary of Ali ibn Ridwan on Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, and above all, the commentaries on Aristotle, of which one can follow a development from Al-Farabi in the 9th century through Ibn Baja or Avon Pache in the early 12th century through Ibn Rushd or Averroes in the late 12th century. Ibn Rushd, of course, provides the prime example of the relevance of explaining Aristotle, writing not only a large commentary, more on this later, whose genre was described in Arabic as a tafsir, but also a summary, paragraph by paragraph, or tarakis, and the presi or epitome of each work of Aristotle, known as a jawami. The letter form was adopted by Al-Kindi, who wrote more, more than 250 of them, who was much influenced by Alexander of Aphrodisias. The Arabs were also aware of two platonic genres, thanks to the translation of Galen's compendium on Plato's Timaeus, in which Galen writes in his preface that, I quote, Plato introduces Timaeus talking, mutakallim, and not in question and answer form, jihal al-mazail al-jawab, as in the books of Plato, giving the words of Socrates. Rather, he gives the whole speech to Timaeus. A vestige of the dialogue form can be seen at the beginning of Ahmad ibn Yusuf's Liber, Book of Ratios and Proportion, which ibn Yusuf recalls, in which he recalls an incident in the court of the Fatimid prince, Khuda ibn Ahmad ibn Tulun of the 10th century, involving the prince, a sheikh, a visitor from Iraq, and ibn Yusuf himself in which the question is raised as to whether or not understanding geometry requires the previous knowledge of another science, namely logic or dialectic. Um, note the end of this long narrative. The teacher, through discussion, had encouraged the branches of knowledge in the visitor, the good student, to grow, which, says Ibn Yusuf, proves how disputation was no hindrance to him. So it supports disputation. But we do also have debate literature called Al-Hawamir, Al-Shawamir, between, for example, Al-Biruni and Ibn Sina, Avicenna on theoretical physics, refutation, Al-Radwa, Al-Shukuk, Ibn Al-Haytham against Ptolemy, Al-Ghazali, Tahafut Al-Falsafa against Avicenna, and, and Jaber Ibn Afla and Ibn Al-Patrik's corrections, again, of Ptolemy's Almagest. The simple question and answer form can also be seen in Hunayn ibn Ishaq's Mazail Field Tib, Questions on Medicine, of which I could give you an example. Where do natural forces come from in the liver? Where do vital forms originate? In the heart. 
where do psychic forces originate in the brain? It's a kind of catechism. Aphorisms remain popular. Following the example of pseudo Ptolemy's Gentiloquium, other astrological aphorisms were attributed to Aristotle, to Hermes, and to Al-Baltani. But as the medical writer Ali ibn al-Abbas al majusi said in respect to Hippocrates' aphorisms, maybe the best known aphorisms, they were in sore need of exemplification and explanation. The Gentiloquium is usually accompanied by such a commentary by the same Ahmad ibn Yusuf, who served the Tulunids, and some people have argued that Ahmad composed the Gentiloquium itself, himself, um, i.e. he artificially followed the genre which combined aphorisms and their explanation. The term muqtasar was used for summary, as in Abu Masha's own summary of his great introduction to astrology, while encyclopedic could be called those works that aim to embrace the whole of a subject. A prime example of this would be the Ku Nash al-Maliki of Ali ibn al-Abbas, um, otherwise known as the Kitab Kamil, Asina Tibiya, the perfect book on medical, the medical art, which provides the theory and practice of the whole of medicine. In turn, Abu Bakr ibn Zakaria al-Razi, Razis in Latin, referred to his enormous collection of medical cases as the Kitab al-Hawi, literally the comprehensive book. And certainly this was how it was interpreted by its Latin translator, Faraj ibn Salim in 1279, who claimed that knowing this book, no other medical text was required. Finally, there were the collections or doctrines, gnomologia, of which the most comprehensive was that of al-Mubashir ibn Fatik, Kitab Mukta al-Hikam wa Muhasin al-Talim, the selections of wise sayings and the most beautiful of words. So we may recognize several genres in Arabic philosophical and medical works, and also scholars' awareness of these different genres, in that they have special words for them, shah for the commentary, muqtasa, um, or iqtasa, jawami, tahriya, mujas, for different kinds of summary, talqis, for paraphrase, hawashi, for mar marginal glosses, rizal, for letters, prolegomeno, or mudakhil, for, um, and gnomologia, often called nukat, or flowers, and tuftafahim, instructional, instructional manuals. I shall not attempt here to show how these different scientific texts were used in the classroom. One would also have to take into account oral teaching, ta'lim in Arabic, which occasionally was written down, and the equivalent of the Greek apophones, something written down from the, from the, the mouth of the teacher. So, simply confining one's attention to Arabic scientific and philosophical texts written before the end of the 12th century, one has a rich variety of forms and genre at a time when Latin scientific literature, by virtue of being more meager, had a smaller range. Of course, there was the rich literature of the computers, which includes Abu, Fle Abu of Fleury's commentary on the calculus of Victorius of Aquitaine, Note the title, Explanatio, it's a kind of commentary, Explanatio, in Calculo Victoria, Rei, quam isagogen, arithmetica. So it was an introduction, plaque et dicere, thesis who call the introduction to arithmetic. And Bede's De Ratione Temporum, which is described by Bede himself as a longer book on time, in contrast to two shorter books written in a summary style. So we have two genre in one there. Also, Martianus Capella um, uh, and the marriage of uh, Mercury and Philology can be regarded as uh, um, encyclopedia work together with Isidore of Seville's Etymologies and Hravanus Maurus de Universo. The Platonic dialogue in the second type described by Galen, i.e. starting and ending with a dialogue, then having a speech in the middle, survives in the form of Chalcidus' translation and commentary on the Timaeus. And Macrobius provides two commentaries, a long and a shorter one, on Cicero's Dream of Scipio. In early medicine, you have fragments of larger textbooks, such as that by Alexander of Charles, the Twelve Books of Medicine, also represented are questions and answers. The Munich computers begins, interrogatio, tempus, quid est, responsio, tempus, spatium, tendens de principio, principio usqua infinum. I think I need hardly translate these very simple Latin phrases. We find commentaries to Galen and De Pulsibus and De Medendi Metodo and encyclopedic works such as the Alphabet, Beitum of Garland and Dioscorides De Re Medica. 
But above all, there were the works of Boethius, an introduction to arithmetic, an introduction to music, several works on Aristotelian logic, of which three are translations of peripatetic works, Porphyry's Isagoge, Aristotle's Categories, and Aristotle's De Interpretatione. Five are commentaries, two commentaries on the Isagoge, a summary on the a commentary on the categories and two commentaries on the De Interpretatione, and four, um, also four original works on logic, added to a commentary on Cicero's topics. Boethius was avowedly taking um, the contemporary early sixth century um, uh, Greek tradition, sorry, uh, he was uh, avowedly taking for himself this Greek tradition which thrived in Alexandria. Boethius was very much aware of the form in which his works were written. His first commentary on Porphyry's Aesagoge, Introduction to Aristotle's Logic, which is based on the Latin translation of Marius Victorinus, takes the form of a dialogue between Fabius and Boethius, from which I quoted at the beginning of this talk. He describes Porphyry's introduction as a bridge, a pons, for preparing the reader to understand what is being presented. Boethius proceeds with the dialogue until the end of the work when Boethius imagines that the new day is breaking, the sun has risen over the grove, and writes, let us get up from our couches, and if there is anything more to be said, it will be dealt with afterwards in a more, with a more diligent consideration. For his second commentary on Porphyry, however, he abandons the dialogue form and takes on the role of the fides interpres, the faithful translator or interpreter. I quote in full this passage at the beginning of his second commentary, which was destined to become very influential and set, as it were, a model to be followed. This, he says, is my second effort at a commentary on the Isagoge. It will follow the text of my own translation, rather than Victorinus's, in which I fear that I shall fall into the fault of the Fides Interpres, since I have rendered word for word and compared the two words involved. The reason for such an approach is that for writings, the aim of which is an understanding of reality, what needs to be brought out is the untainted truth rather than the elegance of refined diction. Hence, I consider myself to have made significant progress to the extent that these philosophical books in the Latin tongue, owing to their complete purity in translation, there's a kind of moral undertone there, leave nothing more to be desired from the Greek. It's a very important passage. In fact, it's so important that I... Well, first of all, this is... Um, the Schoenberg Manuscript 101 of Boethius's first commentary on the Peri Hermeneus and the Interpretationa with this splendid P at the beginning. Most of the manuscript is written in the ninth century, it's an early manuscript, but these uh, first four folios were written in the early 11th century, probably in the time of Abu of Fleury, where the manuscript comes from. Um, and we see here, um, we see here. Um, the well, this, the last part of the introduction of the title to his uh, Boethius's interpretation of the Liber Per Hermeneus of Aristotle. Well, um, and uh, then this is the passage that I've just been quoting. Well, after this rather long preambulum of my own, I now come to the gist of my lectures. What happens when these Arabic texts and genre are taken up by Latin scholars? The earliest examples of Latin scientific literature based on Arabic texts is what we call the Alcandreana, a collection on astrology and a corpus of works on the astrolabe, both of which arose in Catalonia in the mid to late 10th century. This was an unusual period of intense contacts between the Counts of Barcelona and the Caliph of Cordoba. And it is perhaps through personal contacts rather than through merely a transmission of uh, material texts that the Alcandriana and Astrolabe texts have their peculiar form. 
they are not identifiable continuous translations of any Arabic text. Sometimes a paragraph or two will correspond, as is, uh, um, for example, al Khwarizmi's on the astrolabe is recognizable in um, two or three paragraphs. At other times, a table will correspond, the table of the fixed stars on the astrolabe and that of Maslama al-Majriti of 978 AD are the same. But in general, the Arabic nature of the text can be explained in that the construction and the use of the astrolabe are being demonstrated by someone who has learned this from the Arabs, if the teacher himself was not an Andalusi. And the Latin scholar is taking notes, the alim or apophones. Oral communication is plausible also in the case of the astrological text, one of which is written in a crude Romance Latin, which can only be explained as a diplomatic transcription of the words of the teacher or communicator. The most conspicuous element of the astrological text are the Arabic names of the 28 lunar mansions used for prediction. And we can see um, here in a manuscript of a Sloan collection, 2030 from London, we see all these um, Arabic names of the lunar mansions and where they are placed in the signs of the zodiac. We have 28 of them. Two of these astrological texts are phonetically transcribed. I mean, the, 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 the Arabic words are, as it were, written as they were heard rather than through a one let, a letter to letter correspondence between Arabic and Latin. With the astrolabe text, we also have examples of transliteration of the Arabic as it would have been spoken. And we have this very, uh, sorry, this one, curious table here, um, which gives the Arabic text and the Latin translation underneath each line of Arabic text. Arabic text, of course, <coughs> in transliteration. I mean, if, if the words had been heard, they would have been written down, um, even so, in Latin uh, letters. Alaklim alawal, that is the first climb. Ardihi, this should mean the latitude, it does mean the latitude. And then the Arabs use letters for numbers. And so these are two letters, um, Jim and Wow, which stand for 16. And here we have 16 underneath here. We have um, daylight here, um, and um, uh, Nahar, and we have the Alatwal, the longest period of daylight, and so on. So it's. It's a period, an early period of um, getting to grips with the, La and the Arabic text when people were not, not yet familiar with translating and with the words and with the terminology. What we can observe in the case of both corpora, astrology and astrolabe, are crude semi latin texts, texts which were progressively improved. For the astrolabe texts, the most influential of these improvers was Hermann of Car Con Hermanus Contractus, who not only spent his whole life in the highly literary environments of the Benedictine Abbey of Reichenau, but was also himself a poet and a writer of elegant prose. So it was his versions of the astrolabe texts that were diffused throughout the monastic and cathedral schools of the 11th century in Europe, and in particular in Lorraine, which became somewhat of a center for the mathematical arts. Of these texts, the Mensura Astrolapsus was copied into the Schoenberg Manuscript 194 from the mid 12th century um, um, in the context of the quadrivium um, of Gerbert Dorilac's geometry. This is a, a very nice manuscript, very beautifully written. You can see um, this is the beginning of the text of measuring or making, constructing the, um, the astrolabe. And you can see Astrolapsus there. That was the kind of classicizing form of the name of the astrolabe. <coughs> it looks like the fall of the star. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, we can see um, the beginning of um, Gerbert. You can see Gerbert's name up there. Gerbert Dorilac, who became Pope Sylvester II, died in 10, <laughs> 1004. Um, and you can see the beginning of this text on geometry, a special kind of geometry, which was based on land surveying. Um, but he emphasizes at the beginning the importance of geometry as one of the four quadrivial arts to which he is devoted. So we have this setting of the quadrivial arts, um, and we will see that there is a need to fill up the gaps in these quadrivial arts. Especially by Adelard of Bath, whom I will come to next. 
Um, he was still aware of the mathematical tradition established by Gerbert Dolilac and the astrolabe texts of Hermanus Contractus of Reichenau. But in a seven-year journey to Sicily and the newly opened up Crusader states, he became acquainted with Arabic works and set about translating them. He respects the importance of mathematics for teaching, probably because of his own position after his return from his seven-year journey in the entourage of the Bishop of Bath. He composes a work for the abacus to make his, pupil more, his pupils more willing to sip from the quadrivial arts. I quote, I was trying to slip between your lips a few morsels from a platter which had four compartments by giving you first a Pythagorean antidote, which turns out to be the abacus. In his work on the same and the different, um, female personifications of each of the seven liberal arts describe the contents including that of geometry in the tradition of Gerber Dolilac. Above all, he turns to the Arabs for new material. This is expressed most vividly in the Quaesiones Naturalis, his questions on nature, which take the form of a platonic dialogue, especially in the introduction, which sets the scene in the conclusion. When I recently returned to England during the reign over the English of Henry, son of William, since I had absented myself from my native land for a long time, for the sake of study, meeting friends was most delightful and helpful for me. So when on our first meeting, as happens, the questions came thick and fast concerning our health and the health of our friends, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, when these words had been exchanged since a considerable part of the day remained so that there was time for saying something, among the others who were playing their cause was a certain nephew of mine. Sorry, this is at the beginning. He urged me to put forward some new ideas about the studies of the Arabs. But then at the end, he says, now that we have said something about composite things, and since the evening, again, the evening is encouraging us to sleep, let us refresh our minds with natural rest. Tomorrow, if you agree, let us meet to dispute about the beginning of the beginning. So I call this a platonic topping and tailing of the text. And the nephew, as you can see, he said, I cannot agree to anything more readily. I gladly will accept the refreshment of rest so that we may approach the new discussion as refreshed for new men renewed men. Adelaide's translations from Arabic, however, do not show any literary pretensions like this. They are without prefaces, without any elaboration, but they all belong to a single curriculum which might have already been present in one or two Arabic manuscripts that he was following. He retains several Arabic words rather than either in the text or in the margins. Um, as we shall see, his first and probably most important <coughs> translation was the first full translation of Euclid's Elements, the textbook for geometry, um, before any translation from Greek. Perhaps following the precedent of Boethius's Institutiones, which is the title he gave both to his work on um, arithmetic and on music, um, he, Adelard, called his work the Institutio Artis Geometricae ab Euclide de Scripta, i.e. he was adding um, something which was missing to the four um, works of the Quadrivium. It includes copious examples of the original Arabic terms, um, whether this is because he was in a, a teaching context in which Arabic was still being used or because he was uncertain of the most appropriate Latin term is not so clear. But uh, I apologize for the quality of this um, photograph of a manuscript from Bruges where we have in the margin there um, a list of Arabic words for the Latin translations, which are in the text here, including common words like point, nukt, and line, chat, and, um, and uh, column, al amud, um, and uh, angle, al zawaya, and so on. Secondly, he translated um, the abbreviation of the introduction, the muqtasar al-madkal of Abu Masha, translating it using the Greek title isagoga mino, all these introductions to the important journal. Again, it is um, repeat with Arabic words, including those for south and north. And like the tables of Al-Khwarizmi, which he also translated, includes Arabic glosses in the margin. The complete list of conditions of the planet is relate in relation to uh, um, each other um, is listed. These are all the Arabic words for 25 different relations that the planets can form together to, to each other. Iqbal, um, advance, Idder, um, retreat, Mukarina as a conjunction, and so on. 
And finally, he translated the Gentiloquium, a tribute to Ptolemy, of which only the first 39 remain. And strangely enough, he translated without a commentary. It could even have been ex extracted from a text which had the commentary, an example of aphorisms. Just before Adelard, we find another context in which translations were made from Arabic into Latin. In this case, the context is a monastic scriptorium where Constantine the African was working and where he had access to the finest of scriptoria, uh, a kind of research laboratory where scribes could um, write his works for him, and a form of diffusion through the monastic, the Benedictine monastic um, 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 uh, network, which meant that his works uh, arrived throughout Europe very early on. Um, and I just give you an example of a manuscript which was probably written actually in England, uh, maybe even in Salisbury. Um, and uh, just to show the quality of the copies of these works, this would reflect the uh, quality of the work actually uh, uh, produced in Casino where he was working, um, of the main work that I shall just um, turn to now. This is the Pantegni, what we call the Pantegni, which was the translation of the complete book of medicine, the Konash al-Maliki, the encyclopedic work that I mentioned just now. What, but the translation did not work out how one might have expected to. Of the 10 books of theory and 10 books of practice, which, um, uh, of which the work um, was co uh, consisted, um, only a portion was translated. What seems to have happened is that Constantine and his team had a full list of contents of the work, not only the titles of the 20 books, but also the titles of the individual chapters. This would not be surprising because it was the norm in Arabic scientific works to include uh, a full list of contents at the beginning of a book, following the prescription um, of those headings that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that the division of the book should precede the text. And so in Arabic text, in fact, you usually have not only the divisions of the first book, which is what we have here, the first book of the Pantegni, but uh, the divisions of all the books um, of which the, um, the work comprised. Constantine translated more or less all the chapters in the first theoretical part of the book, and the first one and a half and the beginning of the ninth book of the second practical part of the book a certain Johannes Agarenus and Rusticus Pisanus completed book nine, but otherwise the subject matter of the chapters was taken from elsewhere. We have uh, chapters from Ibn al-Jazar's Viaticum, chapters from Sectus Placitus, from the Liber Aureus. Um, one of these texts, the Placitus, is a Latin source. Another is a translation by Constantine. Another, a translation by Constantine's pupil, Johannes Aflatius, and so on to fill in the missing chapters of which they had the chapter headings from the beginning of the, the great um, Kunash al-Maliki. The fact that the Pantegni has been put together from sources other than al-Majusi's Kunash al-Maliki, while retaining the form of al-Majusi's work, justifies Constantine's claim in his own eyes in the headings of the book that he is the author, in the sense that he is the co-adunator of the whole work, the person who put together the whole thing together. The drawbacks of Constantine's translation were well underlined by a later translator, beginning of the 12th century, Stephen of Antioch, who wanted to replace Constantine's translation of the complete book of medicine with a more accurate translation. In this new translation, finished in 1127, Stephen tells us that I stumbled upon a certain book which is called among the Arabs the Complete Book of Medicine. On investigating whether Latinity had any of this book, I found that it lacked the latter and greater part of it, but that the other part had been vitiated through the crafty deceit of the translator, for he took away the name of the author and the title and put himself, who was the translator, as also the creator or inventor of the book, and he entitled the book with his own name. In order to do this more easily, he missed out many necessary things and changing the orders of many things, he put forward things in a different way, observing this alone, that he added nothing at all out of his own invention. So this is really a very severe criticism. 
And in a way, this is true, but I think one can see that Constantine was following the norms of his contemporaries in southern Italy um, in, the, um, in the late 11th century. For example, Alfano, Archbishop of Salerno, to whom Constantine dedicated one of his works, sought to augment the medical corpus by translating Nemesius of Edesses on the nature of man from Greek. But like Constantine, he changed his name, um, substituting Premnon Physicon, a Greek name, again like Constantine, and does not mention the Greek author, but implies in the preface that he, Alfano, is the author. Constantine's Pantegni was immediately very successful, being read not only by doctors, but also by natural sciences, philosophers and theologians such as William of Conche and William of Santieri. Partly, we must suppose, we may suppose, because the language was written, um, in which it was written was akin to that used by the philosophers, unfussy, simple, but idiomatic Latin, which conveyed information in a clear way and avoided, unlike Adelard, using Arabic words. We have a few, but um, not many. The Pantegni was only one, though the largest, of several medical texts translated from Arabic by Constantine and his colleagues, several of which were copied into Schoenberg's manuscript number 24, of which we saw an image at the very beginning of the Dominican teaching his pupils. It seems to be in a Dominican manuscript. Um, and here we have the beginning of the third book of a work called Isaac Israeli on particular diets, telling you what to eat for and for, for a healthy lifestyle, very, very similar to what you see, what I've just been watching on American television recently at night, <laughs> um, the keto diet, uh, diet or whatever. But here we have um, um, at the beginning of a book on what um, fruit and vegetables to eat. Um, so, and it's got another Dominican, as you can see, teaching to have with a student. Um, um, now, um, I wish I could spend more on Constantine, especially since it's a very beautiful manuscript, um, uh, including works mainly by, mainly translated by Constantine. We now may switch back to the Iberian Peninsula. Here we have several corpora of texts. The works of John of Seville form a corpus of astrological, astronomical texts. The earliest two of these um, are in letter form. Um, Costa Ibn Lucas, and are not indeed on astrology or astronomy. Costa Ibn Lucas' short work on the difference between the soul and the body, described in one Arabic manuscript as a letter from Hunayn Ibn Ishaq to Ahmad Ibn Musa, but simply as a liber in Latin. And secondly, an exer excerpt from the book on the secret of secrets, the liber quod Arabice vocata sire sire, um, a long letter written by Aristotle, or alleged to have been written by Aristotle for Alexander the Great. John of Seville had, Seville had been asked by the Queen of Spain to write a brevis libellus about the observation of healthy living, but found the appropriate material in pseudo-Aristotle's work. So this was um, a substitute for a short little book in letter form. The rest of his works, however, form a curriculum in astronomy and astrology and are entirely translated from Arabic. A large number of them are brought together in the 12th to 13th century manuscript Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Latin 16204, which consists of 584 pages and contains over 30 texts, entirely, almost entirely, translations by John of Seville. There are precedents in Arabic for manuscripts containing a very large collection of works on the sciences called Majmu'a, um, which means Indeed, collection, um, such as manuscript Columbia 306, which includes the middle text, or those texts which are supposed to be read between reading Euclid's Elements and Ptolemy's Arm Address. Here's just the, uh, the cover, or, well, um, um, the frontispiece of the work, I suppose, where you see the list of all the texts which are included in this, uh, over 30 texts, uh, rather beautifully described here with the page numbers. Um, you have Hagia Sophia, Istanbul, 4832, which includes both mathematical and philosophical works, 65 in total. And the ancestor of this Paris manuscript may well be an early example of a Latin manuscript of this type, um, which could have been assembled in Toledo, where some of the, uh, the, the works were obviously translated. 
The individual, individual works also repre represent different literary genres. The manuscript includes, first of all, the comprehensive textbooks with which it starts, the great introduction, great conjunctions of Abu Masha, works of over 450 and 250 printed pages, respectively, in modern editions. Also, it includes more popular collections of doctrines, such as the anthology, Flores, on the revolution of what the higher things signify to the lower things, which, I quote, Albu Mazar carried around with him on his journeys because he had placed in it the flowers of things and other things which he chose, um, which he picked and which pleased him. Then it includes John's own excerpts from Abu Masha's on the revolutions of the nativities described as sententiae um, about the revolutions of the years excerpted from the book of Abu Masha on the same subject. The reasons for excerpting sententiae are stated in the opening words. I quote, since the time for doing things is always very short, but the revolution of years is prolix, um, uh, echoes of Hippocrates, it is necessary for us to excerpt a few things from many, lest through negligence we remain without profit from such a big book. It includes, this Paris manuscript, short works by Masha Allah, of which one is explicitly called a letter. And finally, we have the aphorism genre, the tentiloquium or pseudotolemy again. Um, first, without the commentary, as Adelard had presented it, and then with the commentary of Ahmad ibn Yusuf. And I've just got a picture of the beginning of the tentiloquium from this very Paris manuscript. You can see that the actual words of Ptolemy are in red, uh, and the commentary of Ahmad ibn Yusuf is in black, um, but we'll say more about this genre in the third lecture. These works show consistency of terminology and even of style, a rather literal style, um, which is adopted in Latin texts on astrology even when they're not translations from Arabic. A conspicuous example of this is the Ten Books of Astrology written by Guido Bonatti in about 1277, which begins by aping an Arabic introduction to a book with phrases lifted from Abu Masha's great introduction and great conjunctions. You can see um, from the italicized word just how much is that, um, Arabic, in fact, even more. In nomine domini, I mean, this is very, very like the Bismillah in Arabic. Um, and then in nomine Dei Nostri, well, of course, substituting Jesus Christ. Miserator is a PE, that's in the, uh, that's certainly in Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Um, and the true God and true man, that's Christian again. Qui non es par, it's the most typical phrase uh, identifying a Muslim as a multi Muslim. There is no equal to God. Then you have Mary. Um, and non nec es deus praetor ipsum, that's even more so. There is no God but God. Uh, and this is, is a phrase taken, lifted entirely from Abu Masha's um, great um, introduction. Um, and uh, the fact that the stars are lights in the sky, etc., and provide a ducatus, a leadership for inferior things. So not only are these uh, translations based in their um, syntax, their terminology, um, their style on Arabic works because of their literal translation, but they influence original Latin works on the same subjects because they, as it were, set um, a particular language as being most appropriate for a particular subject. Contemporary with John of Seville were two translators who adopted a rather original approach, Hugo, Santal Hugo Santaliensis and Herman of Carinthia. Hugo Santaliensis worked for Michael, Bishop of Tarazona from 1119 to 1151 in whose cathedral he signed two documents in 1145. He was probably the magister of the cathedral, magister scholarum. His style is different from that of John of Seville's in that he wrote extensive prefaces to all his translations. Neither did he follow the Arabic slavishly. One of the most revealing of his statements can be found in his preface to a text that explains the canons of astronomical tables. Um, he says lest, completely stepping in the footsteps of the ancients, i.e. of the Arabs there, I should seem to be at variation with the moderns, I will undertake this work not through a dialogue form, as it is in the Arabic, 
but in the way that is now usual and followed. Is this really the custom of the schools in Constantine and Hugo, well, in Hugo of Santana's time? Um, in this case, we can glimpse the original Arabic, which is no longer extant, through a literal translation into Hebrew, which can be compared with the Latin. The Hebrew begins with a question. Why did our Khwarizmi say, concerning the derivation of the months of the Arabs, take the complete years of the years of the Arabs? Which Hugo changes into an imperative. At the beginning of each Arabic month, as al Khwarizmi says, should be worked out, lay out the complete Hijra years. Well, there's an imperative in the first as well, but there's no question in Hugo. The Hugo text is chopped up into question and answer, whereas Hugo's text is more continuous, at least for the first nine pages, after which Hugo reverts to the question and answer form after all. But what I find interesting is that Hugo Sanctaliensis also forged a genre of his own in Latin. This genre consisted of works attributed to Hermes Trismegistus or Apollonius of Tiana and belonged to the most ancient magical mystical tradition. Um, we can see, uh, here we are, this is um, the main work of Apo Pseudo Apollonius uh, on the secrets of nature that um, uh, Hugo translated and we see both Hermes described here, a uh, little biography and a longer biography of Apollonius down here and interestingly enough, a schema of the relationship of all the um, arts and sciences to each other. But here's Apollonius writing his text, which is a summary um, uh, which is said to have been discovered, um, a book from a book of Hermes discovered in the tomb of Hermes. These books, translated by Hugo Sanctaliensis, um, conjure up a secret society of mystical religious philosophy. For example, in his preface, to his own translation of the Centiloquium of Ptolemy, Hugo exhorts his dedicated not to commit the secrets of such wisdom into the hands of any unworthy individual. And in the preface to the Geomancy, he describes how God instills a kind of intuitive knowledge into select individuals. And the bonds which are thus established between them are parallel to the bonds which govern and preserve the universe. The Tabula Smaragdina, the Emerald Tablet, ends with an exuberant but enigmatic hymn, which occurs in the same position as the sacred hymn in the Asclepius, the one hermetic text translated into Latin in antiquity. This is not quite poetry in Arabic or in Latin, but elevated prose beginning, higher things from lower things, lower things from higher things. The operation of wonders, um, here we are, um, from the one, just as all things draw their source from one and the same thing. This text was used as a profession of faith by alchemists and talisman makers ever after. So here we have a, a separate genre of magical text which has its own tone, its own syntax, its own style. But there is another genre to which Hugo contributed. This time it seemed with the participation of Herman of Corinthia um, in an, an attempt to be complete um, in presenting knowledge. This is the method used in what we call the Book of the Three and the Book of the Nine Judges, works in which both of them were involved and which include the judgments on a large range of topics of astrological, three and nine astrological authorities respectively. The purpose is to allow the reader to choose between the teachings of different authorities and come to his or her own conclusion on which is best and most reliable, and consequently put it into practice. The preface of the Liber Trium Judicum describes the method and its justification. Um, Hugo writes, I think it's Hugo here, here, amongst the Arabs whom it is especially befitting for us to imitate, being as it were our teachers and predecessors in this art, astrology, so many and vast are the volumes of judgments that if anyone is tempted to translate them into Latin, it would seem easier for him to hew out entirely new material than to describe or bring by bringing their opinions into one place. But since at present it is not appropriate to invent new things, and we have inventing here, to the neglect of the old, nor is the translation of all works practicable because of their number, from the bulk of all the volumes before me, I've decided to bring together in one volume only what our hesitant opinion has chosen as the most important. 
and what the old authority of astrologers has commended. Of these, the first will be Sakhal ibn Bishr, the second will be Umar ibn al Khan at Tabari, and the third will be al Kindi. He mentions Masha'Allah again too, but he only occurs in the introduction, in the preface. Thus, to take one topic at random, if one wants to know about the status of a captive, first we have a chapter from Sakhal. Um, you can see um, Sakhal down about the captive, the status <laughs> of captive Sakhal. Then we have um, a paragraph from Umar ibn al Farouk Khan. Then we have a, a sentence, uh, a paragraph from Al Kindi about the same thing. In the middle of the 12th century, when this was written, we do not find such a genre in Latin literature. Collections of differing views of lawyers on related issues start to be put together in the second half of the 12th century with the titles Dissensiones Dominorum, but they were used in the classroom rather than in practice. The closest we get to, um, in terms of a, well, a name, is a compilatio. The most famous self-styled compilatio is Vincent of Beauvais' mid-13th century speculum. As Alistair Minnis writes, the compilator has a former tractandi all of his own, what Vincent calls the mode of the excerptor, modus excerptoris. In Vincent's case, each chapter is an excerpt from the work of an authority, and occasionally a second authority will be cited for the same topic. Uh, for example, Isidorus de Aodem. But Vincent himself, uh, and Vincent himself, sometimes imposes some text or chapter under the rubric actor. But this is not quite the same as what we find in Herman and Hugo, um, where we have many authors speaking about the same thing so that the reader can judge which is the best. Herman of Hugo's endeavor is, in fact, found in Arabic. Um, the late 9th century astrologer called al Kasrani composed a kitab al Mazail fi il Mahkam and al book of questions on astrology, in which he brought together interrogations compiled from the works of at least seven astrologers, including Masha'ad and al Kindi, while the early 12th century author al Darmarani included a still larger number of authorities in his Majmu Akawi al Hukama al Munajimin, the collection of sayings of the wise astrologers. To turn to Herman of Carinthia himself, in his work one can see the purest examples of platonic dialogue, of the form that introduces and completes texts. This is a form that Herman would have known from Chalcidius's translation and commentary of the Simaeus, which was very influential on him. What is most distinct, of course, is the reference at the beginning um, of the work of the circumstances of the dialogue. Herman of Carinthia's De Essentis begins with a supposed conversation between uh, himself and his dedicatee, Robert of Ketton, in which Herman records an episode in their lives. You remember, I think, um, while, we were going, yeah. um, while we were going forth from our inner sanctuaries into the public festival of Minerva, the multitude of people milling around were gaping at us with open mouths, not valuing us so much as individuals as admiring the trappings and decorations which long vigils and our most earnest labor had acquired for us from the depths of the treasures of the Arab and the treasuries of the Arabs. Then at the end of the day, Essences, Herman says, the remaining topic, i.e. man, must be taken up. And now that the end is expected, the whole work must be brought to completion, to which Robert replies, quite so, Herman. Otherwise, either the ear becomes weary with the length of the talk or the memory becomes so weighed down with facts that it is unable to see the unity of the whole order and retain it. Well, I think maybe your, your memories are getting so <laughs> full of facts that, uh, and uh, the guillotine is about to descend. <laughs> so if you could just give me um, a couple of more minutes and then I shall, well, I shall bring this to an end. Herman and Adelard share the distinction of being associated with the school of Chartres, where Thierry, the ch chancellor of the cathedral, described by Herman as the soul of Plato returned to earth, was Herman's teacher. A contemporary of theirs was William of Conch, who in 1149 wrote a dialogue on natural philosophy, which he called dragmaticon, the diametric, diam, dramatic dialogue in Greek, between the Duke of Normandy and the philosopher, in which inter alia the Duke says, if the opinion of a pagan is to be cited, I prefer you to quote Plato than any other, for he accords better with our faith. So Plato's in the air. Herman did not, however, use the dialogue form for his scientific translations from Arabic. 
His translation of Abu Mashar's great introduction is often described as a paraphrase. This is not, however, what he regarded it as. It is true that he deliberately did not follow Boethius' example of a three days in Terpres, who left nothing out. He asks his delicatee, again Robert of Ketton, for permission to depart from Boethius' injunction, which I mentioned earlier on, when he claims to follow the Latin in only including five headings instead of the Arabic seven. The um, main difference in Hermann's list, and you'll find it on your handout, is that he differentiates between the aim of the author and the intentio libri, the aim of the book, which he calls the final cause, causa finalis. Both the intention of the author and the Aristotelian final cause are used in introducing books in the circle of Thierry of Chartres. Nevertheless, having been persuaded by his colleague Robert of Ketton that he should follow the precept of Boethius, to be a few days in her praise, he translated the work, words that Abu Masha writes at the beginning of his book, i.e. the explication of each of the seven headings. Like Hugo, Hermann combines his own preface with that of Abu Masha, but the rest of his translation is influenced rather by the style and language of Thierry of Chartres and his pupils. This is true at the level of the language he uses and also the style um, of the same scholars, for example, Thierry's and his pupils, Claren, pupil Clarenbold of Arras's commentaries on Boethius's theological works. So that for each major section of Abu Mashar's work, Hermann first of all introduces the topic, a kind of continuatio, and then summarizes what Abu Masha has to say on the subject. So, um, uh, for example, in chapter one, uh, he says, first we must explain what reasons first excited man um, when placed on earth to investigate the degrees of the heavenly council and then to make progress in them. For it does not seem that such a course would have been seized upon by some unpremeditated action or by some sudden impulse. Nor, would the expenditure, nor without the expenditure of the greatest effort. None of this is in Abu Masha, who goes straight on to describe the difference between astronomy and astrology. In fact, Hermann saw the translations that he and Robert had been making as contributing the te to the teaching of Thierry, whether this was in Chartres or later in Paris. The earliest phase of this teaching is represented in the two large volumes that made up the Heptateuchon compiled in circa 1141 in, by Thierry in Chartres, which brought together the principal texts of the seven liberal arts, we're back to the seven liberal arts, and included Adelard's or Bath's versions of Euclid's elements and the translation of Alcoholismi's astronomical tables. Hermann addressed a translation of Ptolemy's planisphere to Thierry. He mentions Ptolemy's Armagest and Tetrabiblos as the works most relevant for astronomy and astrology, respectively, but Albertani as a, succinct, as a succinct version of the first and Abu Masha as a fuller version of the second, which he and Robert have both translated. Perhaps he hoped that Thierry would include these new translations in the second edition of the Heptateuchon. In any case, these translations were meant to educate and they were written in such a style that they would be appropriate, the word he uses is commodissimus, for the classroom. So we started this talk with a picture of the classroom and we shall end it today with a picture of the classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The erudition is overwhelming. I have a very simple question, which is how can you, uh, do we have some understanding of how, say, Her uh, Herman or Adelard or Robert of Ketton, how they learned their Arabic? Well, that's a very good question, of course. Um, first of all, perhaps they didn't, um, because we have so many examples of hidden interpreters who were usually Jews. Um, Herman and Robert were also um, um, commissioned to translate the Koran, which is very important. Um, but, uh, but the person who commissioned them, Peter the Venerable, said there was a Muhammad who 
that's the, maybe more in doctrinal. I mean, I think Herman and uh, Herman was a, maybe a good a good um, Arabist, but um, um, we have, uh, as I will say uh, uh, tomorrow, in fact, uh, several examples of Jewish intermediaries um, who were translating probably into the vernacular language, Spanish, or even vernacular Arabic. Um, and then, um, then the Christian would be putting that translation into Latin or into good Latin. As, as for, we don't, we, well, we do have, towards the end of the 12th century, we do start having um, glossaries, um, but no, no grammars, no, nothing like that. No. If, the, if they learned, it was through personal contact. I was interested in what you were saying about Bodhias being the inter, what is it, Fides Interpres? Fides Interpres. And uh, mm. how he said there's nothing more to be desired from the Greek now. Yes. And I was kind of interested in how like self-important and presumptuous that kind of is. Well, it is, yeah. And yes. how you see the development between like what is the language on the page and what is what are the ideas and thoughts that the language is representing and how that um, changes because I think that you know the in well, Fides interpretes isn't you, always you can sort of yes, Fides interpretes. I guess. First of all, in Boethius's mind, if you were absolutely literal in your translation, so that every word, every Greek word had a Latin equivalent, um, then indeed you could throw away the Greek because you had everything in Latin. Um, also, of course, you're dealing with a society in which the sacred literature was already translated, but was accepted mm -hmm. as a translation. I mean, there were debates as to whether um, Jerome well, should have been more literal or, should, or whether one should take the, the Gallic version or the Hebraic version of the Psalms and that sort of thing. But, but um, Christians were, um, well, accepted that translations could be as good, if, even if not better than the original. I mean, there are some debate as to whether Jews, for example, their, their Hebrew works, um, um, in the process of transmission had deteriorated so that the Latin translation made in the third century was in fact more reliable than the Hebrew translation of contemporaries in the 12th century. Mm. Could you say a few words um, explaining the uh, the scene setup that Herman of Corinthia is doing in this passage? Is it is it typical of the way this material operates? It looks very peculiar. Why do you think it's peculiar? Well, I mean, it's literally not true. There are no festivals of Minerva in 1100. <laughs> um, so is it an elaborate? It's a uh, metaphor, yes. Okay. But is, is this a common metaphor that's used by these philosophers in speaking to each other? I mean, there, there are hints of, of the opening of the Republic in it. Yes. Um, is, is that the kind of allusion that is typical as a scene set up? Well, maybe you could say Herman and Robert were more classical in their training and their propensities than the almost well, certainly the literal translators, I was going to say almost mechanical translators into Mega, but, but in fact that's doing them an injustice. But um, um, Herman starts off his De Essentius by, by saying to Robert, you remember that the daughters of Minerva, the Atlantides, were complaining because we had been separated from each other. Um, and really, uh, we, uh, they, we had to get... The, and, then, and then he sees this vision of Athena herself with all the paraphernalia of the, the four liberal arts. So it's, um, um, it's, he's employing um, a very elaborate uh, metaphor drawing on classical knowledge. Um, it's a, maybe it's a, it's a way of you know, boasting or, uh, um, uh, about, it, about his knowledge. But, um, but, but underneath, I mean, there is some truth. It is a metaphor of, of some truth that he and Robert must somehow have been and drawing on um, Arabic texts, if not um, um, being in contact with Arabic teachers from which they learned this new material, which 
um, Herman was very keen to present in the De Essentis, um, which, although it is uh, an original work, is absolutely full of material that um, uh, he got from the Arabs um, um, and incorporated in his translations of Abu Mashar and, um, um, and others. Thank you very much for this. Uh, and, uh, related to the um, scientific subjects like uh, or Ibn Sina or Abu Bakr Razi or mm. Khwarizmi, uh, there is uh, in this manuscript, did you find any uh, formula for that or equation or uh, scientific diagrams or anything like that? Well, you'll see more of those, I think, tomorrow and on Thursday, because I didn't show uh, an Arabic manuscript this time, but, uh, but certainly in the Schoenberg collection, there are, there's a very fine uh, manuscript of Ptolemy's Almagest, for example, which is full of very well-drawn diagrams, and it's my theory um, that it was the accuracy of these diagrams in Arabic manuscripts in scientific works, whether it was Euclid's Elements, or the in-between works, the Mutabasat, um, between uh, Euclid and Ptolemy, um, that provided um, models for dra of draftsmanship that were followed um, by the scholars in Toledo. Um, for example, for the first time, um, they were able to um, depict quite accurately three-dimensional geometrical objects. And spheres and cones and so on. And this was because the Arabs had already done that. Thank you. Uh, this concludes speaker's round.